job tonight is to give you a general introduction to what happens on an archaeological dig and then I'm going to show you some of the um, archaeological sites that we visited. So you want to get your uh, gear together, grab some water because it's going to be hot out there and uh, we'll get started. So uh, when you think about archaeology, what's the first thing that pops in your mind? Probably something like Indiana Jones, like this, right? <laughs> You're going to go and uh, rob, a, rob a temple, right? Get the gold, get the treasure. And you know what archaeology is really like? It's like this. <laughs> it's a lot of hard work, all right? That's, that's really what it's about. So archaeology is a study of previous civilizations through discovering and examining the objects they left behind. So it may be buildings, it may be tablets, it may be manuscripts, it may be coins, it may be leftover uh, bones from their food, right? So those are things that uh, archaeologists look for. So, you know, if, if you're going to be an archaeologist, if you want to really do that, you need a lot of different skills. Uh, you need to know history, you need to understand botany, because uh, there's plant matter that people left behind, right? So uh, you might find date pits or something like that. Uh, you might find seeds, you might find bones, you need to be able to identify them. They do survey work. They don't just plot, uh, start digging holes randomly, they have to do it in a very systematic way. You may need to be able to read ancient languages of the people that you're trying to study. You may need to be able to identify pottery that you find. You may have to look at coins and identify them. Maybe even need to be able to operate a heavy machine, all right? Uh, and then who knows about if you're going to be climbing on the sides of cliffs or inside caves, you might need to be able to do that as well. Uh, one of the women that was working with us, uh, she works with the Israeli Antiquity Authority, that's the IAA up there. Anyway, she would, we would bring stuff over to her and we would say, what's this, right? And she would identify it for us. And we would go up over and over again because we find something and she'd be either excited or uh, that's just a piece of salt <laughs> that drips through the cave. Uh, here's some survey workers that were across the canyon from us. Uh, one of the questions you might ask yourself is how they got there. Uh, tools. Often when we think of archaeologists, and we think they've got little brushes, right, to clean stuff up, and then they have maybe a trowel to dig with, and what you find out that there's all sorts of equipment. A lot of what they do is very high tech. So they would be using things like ground penetrating radar. In fact, uh, they were doing surveys before we got there with that. Uh, they use drones and satellites. They use GPS surveying equipment, computer mapping. In fact, you'll see pictures of them with their tablets out there as they're mapping the sites. Uh, they would use small and large hand tools. In fact, you'll see a lot of pictures of uh, the students here using pickaxes and hoes to do the digging with. And uh, then there's the small hand tools that you would probably have expected. And you might even see heavy equipment out there. In fact, see the bobcat there? That's a fun story. Because uh, Drew, when he saw that bobcat the first time, he's like, wow, can I drive it? And McCall, one of the female workers there, said, no, that's my job. And he was like, surprised, you can drive a bobcat? And then her response was, well, I'm licensed to drive a tank. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, you got to remember, just about everybody there has been in the Israeli army. So one of the things you also have to figure out, and the lead archaeologist will be figuring this out for you, is what the purpose of the excavation is. Each dig site will have a different goal and the different goals will determine what methods you use. So for example, you might want to be trying to figure out how somebody was living at a certain place. And to do that, you might be sifting through every bit of dirt that you dig up, because you're interested in finding those little pieces of bone or from their food. Or you might be interested in finding the pits from their olives or whatever else they ate. It would tell you about their diet. So you'd be sifting through everything. And then who knows what you might find as well, like a coin or, uh, piece of rope. Uh, if the goal is to uncover architecture, the work may proceed faster and the material may be um, not sifted at all. So you'll see two completely different methods in what's done. 
Typically, if you go to an archaeological site, though, what you're going to be working in is a five by five meter square. Okay. So they'll lay it out, it'll be surveyed. There'll be a grid of these squares. Now, and they won't necessarily be connected. So if they're trying to do like a large survey, they may have what looks like random, but they're really trying to do some exploratory digging to see where the edges of the structure are. And then as time goes along, they would be filling those in so they can connect the walls and, and parts that you're working on. Now, as you start to dig your five by five meter square, uh, they'll want you to start digging down that whole square evenly, so it all goes down together. They don't want you big, uh, digging a deep hole in it, right? Because then uh, all the layers of that dirt get mixed up. So you want to be digging it down uh, slowly and uh, evenly across the whole square. As small items are found, you would be placing them into a labeled bucket. So you have your fine bucket. Now, they may be marking that with tags. They may be marking that with tape, colored tape to show exactly which square it came out of. So, and they might even want to, f if you find something really significant, they'd probably want to photograph it as it's in place, all right? And if you find any ancient walls, you want to leave those intact. So they can, again, see what the whole structure looked like. And then when you get to the desired depth that they've told you to work on, uh, they'll have you clean everything up, make sure to, uh, floor is completely smooth, you straighten up the bulkheads, the, that's the walls, and then you're going to start dusting everything off and make it look pretty for the photograph. So you will see people using brushes. So here's uh, some of the archaeologists here recording notes about the, the five, five meter uh, grid. Uh, here's uh, Dr. Whitlock resetting a corner post of one of the grids. You have a student cleaning up the square with a brush. What do archaeologists look for? So while finding treasure would be exciting, right? We'd all like to be in Indiana Jones and find something great. Or would it be great if we actually found a Dead Sea Scroll? That, that would be a treasure to us. Uh, they're not really interested that much in treasure hunting. Their goal is to find out more about the past by uncovering and understanding both the architectural remains and small finds. So architecture think big things like buildings, small finds think something that can be moved into a museum. So again, we got buildings of different uh, forms. We got fortifications. We have a lot of water works. Water is very important in the Middle East. So you'll see a lot of uh, pictures up here dealing with water of some, in some way. Small finds, we have pottery, coins, organic material, clothing, or little pieces of fabric, inscriptions, manuscripts, the detrius of life, that's everything that people throw out, right, cast off. All right, uh, that's a camel bone. How did the camel get in the cave? One piece at a time. He was dinner. <laughs> so one of the things that you'll start to find is that there's a lot of pottery. And you may ask yourself, why is pottery so important? And it's because the style of pottery changed over time, just like styles of clothing do here. And so you can use that pottery to date where, uh, when that site was being inhabited. Right? So use the pottery for dating. Uh, pottery also had regional characteristics. For example, what clay it was made out of, what the glazes were like, what the design was like. And so that will allow archaeologists to track trading partners, right? Who was this uh, community trading with? And because different types of jars were used for different purposes, right, you can see what was going on at that particular location, maybe in that particular room. And also the quality of pottery could tell us about the socioeconomic status of this community. So was it really expensive pottery or was it just very crude pottery? Again, it can tell you a lot about the community. Broken pottery is mostly what we find. And there's everywhere. Everywhere you look, there's broken pottery. So if, if you went on this trip, in fact, everybody uh, that went, how many of you found uh, pottery pieces? Every one of us. It's everywhere. So if you, if you ever go on a trip, you are 100% likely to find something. Or you're just the unluckiest person in the world. <laughs> and what happens is, is once the clay has been made and it's been fired, it's like a rock. It's going to last forever, right, in the dirt. So 
The most important fragments are things like handles, bases, rims, because that can identify what the use of that piece of pottery was. So they always told us to look out for those type of elements. If you ever found something with decorations or writing, they would be extremely excited about that. And what would be even neater is to find a potsherd where they use the fragment as a piece of paper to write on. Okay, so uh, we will call those ostrica. We get the word ostracized for, from that. Uh, the ancient Greeks would use those pieces of pottery, since they're everywhere, for ballots. And they would vote if somebody should leave this town or not. So if they did, then you were ostracized. All right, here's some examples of important small finds. Here's a heel bone that's pierced with a nail. First century. Isn't that amazing? Here's a horned altar. You might read in the Old Testament about somebody going and grabbing the horns of the altar, like Joab, right? And so you can see what the horns are. They actually are sort of like horns on the side. That was found at Beersheba. Here's another, by the way, that would have been a high place, right? It's an unauthorized altar. Anything outside of Jerusalem would have been a high place. Uh, this is also one of those high places. This is at, found at an Israelite fortress at um, Arad. Okay. And that's their Holy of Holies. It's been reconstructed there. Uh, this is a fragment from a warning sign to Gentiles not to go into the forecourt of the temple. You cross this line, you're taking your life in your own hands. By the way, notice what language that's in. It's in one the Gentiles can read. It's in Greek. This is the Tel Dan Stel. It's the earliest inscription referring to the house of David from the 9th century BC. And all these are from the Israeli Museum. Uh, here's the Shalom, in, or Shalom inscription. Uh, this is an inscription that was in Hezekiah's tunnel talking about how it was made. And they found it in the middle where they met. This is really neat. Uh, this is one of the things I was really happy to be able to see there. This is the oldest piece of biblical text that we have. And it was found buried with a, a small girl and it was rolled up. So, I mean, it's really tiny. And in fact, you won't be able to read the writing because the, the point that was made with this is probably about the size of a human hair that etched that silver. And it has the blessing from the book of Numbers. The Lord bless you and protect you and it goes on from there. So that was really neat to be able to see that. We have evidence that our Bible was back in the seventh century, right? That's when that's from. And uh, everybody's favorite hero from the Bible, or one of them, Herod. Uh, this is his reconstructed sarcophagus. Notice it's reconstructed because the people who came later, they didn't like him. So they destroyed it and scattered the parts all over the place. So uh, if you see the dark patches in it, that's the real parts. Everything else was built up around it to help complete it. That was found at the Herodium. Uh, there's an anchor. Apparently, they used to sail into Dead Sea. And you can see the salt sediment that is embedded in underneath it, the layers there. Uh, here's some scribal instruments. So what, if you were a scribe back then, what would you use to write? Well, they found examples. There's some ink pots and pens and uh, clay, a wax tablet at the top. Now, there are two types of sites that uh, you can look at. One is a single occupation site. There's one layer to it. But a lot of the sites around Israel are multi-layer sites. Okay? So um, they often develop into mounds, which we will call tells. All right? So tells. A tell is a mound created by successive occupation of a site. So each time a site was, uh, what would happen is somebody would build a city, and somebody else would come and knock it down. And somebody else would move in later, because it was probably a good place to live in the first place. That's why they built there. And they'd build a new city. And then somebody else would come and knock it down. And they kept repeating this. And so what you end up with is something that looks like a multi-layer birthday cake. Right? You got multiple layers. And so as you're going down through them, you're going backwards in time. So uh, you can see uh, some of these sites go back thousands of years. They have a lot of occupation levels. For example, the Tel of Megiddo has 26 layers. By the way, you would probably know that as Armageddon, which means the hill of Megiddo. All right? It's 26 layers. Jericho has 23 layers. 
to it. Fully excavating some of these mounds, we were told, would probably take 100 plus years. That's how much <laughs> stuff there is. It's like excavating a mountain. And you can see how far down, that's a huge round altar. The priests could walk up on it. They could take a uh, full ox up on there with them and, and, uh, and sacrifice it. And you can see how far down that is. There are some problems with excavating tells. First of all, if you want to uncover an earlier layer, you've got to take off the layers above it, right? And as you do that, you're destroying those layers. So you can't just, well, I want to get to this layer and do it real quick. You have to be thorough because you might want that information from those layers above it. And the layers are not always even. even. Uh, so, for example, they would dig pits into it. Maybe somebody wanted a basement or they wanted some uh, storage area under their house, so they would dig a pit. Or if they're going to put a foundation in, they would dig trenches for the foundation. And so you can't count on a layer being nice and smooth. Also, some of the sites lay barren for years between occupations. So, for example, Jericho, what, had, what did Joshua do after he destroyed the city? He cursed whoever would rebuild it, right? And so it lay uh, open to the elements, and so you have erosion going on, which destroys a lot of evidence. And also, you know what? Builders don't want to have to go and cut a stone out of the ground if there's a whole bunch of already cut ones that are available. And so they would loot the buildings that were already there and use the stones, repurpose them. And you can see that here. So let's see. Uh, you've got a decorative stone right there. You've got a pillar going through the wall right there. You've got some that have these borders cut on them and others that don't. Okay, so this, these, this building right here is made out of repurposed stones. You'll see that very frequently uh, throughout uh, Israel. All right, some of the archaeological sites that we visited. So uh, probably the primary one that everybody's interested in or a lot of people are interested in are the Qumran Caves. So that's a Qumran K4. And if you think about it, it's amazing. There are manuscripts that stayed hidden in these caves for 2,000 years, or very close to that. And they were still readable. And that's how arid that environment is. Here's, we had a lecture inside Cave 11. So you, we actually got to walk into some. And let's see, I bet everybody could tell you what was right outside that cave that went on the trip. Viper. There was a viper. Right outside. Yeah, we saw our first day. What did we see? A deadly snake. We all made it in. And out, yes. <laughs> uh, this is the ruins of the Qumran community. Right there, we, you see a mikvah. You can see the steps going on, down into it. A mikvah is a ritual bath. The uh, ASEANs at Qumran uh, would have daily rituals of bathing to stay pure. All right. And they needed lots of water. So uh, one of the things that you would see was their water collection system and these uh, tanks to store water in. Okay. Water is very important if you're living out in this environment. Masada. By the way, I'm going to include some uh, animals from there as we go along. So we, we actually saw this mouse up on top. So this is one picture that I did not take. I didn't have, I didn't think the Israelis would be very fond of me bringing a drone to take aerial pictures. So I, I borrowed this one off the internet. Anyway, that's what Masada looks like if you've never seen it. It's very impressive. Herod decided he's going to build a fortress on top. Okay. And uh, here we're looking at the rubble on top and some of the buildings that have been uh, rebuilt. There's a model of it. So that we had a lot of uh, visitors up there that day. There's some kids here enjoying it. Here's looking down on one of the uh, palace structures that's at Masada from above. Here we're having a lecture by Oren Gutfield um, at the top of Masada. So he was uh, the person we worked with. He's a lead archaeologist. This right here is a ramp. Uh, when you, you see movies and people are attacking cities, usually you just see fighting. You don't see things like this. But what the Romans would do, if, if you couldn't take a city, and you'll see one other ramp in this uh, 
series of slides, is they would build a ramp up against the city. And you wonder, how in the world can you build a ramp with the defenders of the city there? Well, they would go and have all the local inhabitants volunteer. volunteer. Yeah, volunteer. So uh, if your brother's out there, or your uncle, or your cousin, and they're making the wall, are you going to shoot them? Are you going to throw boulders down on them? By the way, they use a lot of rolling boulders. And no, you're, you're going to let them. And so they end up building this huge ramp, and then they pull this large battering ram up, and they knock the wall down, and then they, they invaded. So that's the ramp. Uh, it took them two years to build that. This was the last place to fall uh, during the Jewish revolt. There's a Roman fortification at the base of Masada. So you can see the walls of the fortification. They would be probably living in tents here. And then right down here, this structure here, is a perimeter wall to make sure nobody in Masada escaped. Here uh, we see uh, columbarium. They're quite popular. People raised pigeons there. And so those would be niches for them. That is a jackal. And we actually didn't see him at the Herodium. We saw him there where we're camping. And we could hear him at night, right? Yeah, so a jackal. Uh, this is the Herodium from a distance. It looks sort of like a volcano, doesn't it? This is our, some of the remains closer up. And the Herodium was another fort. Herod liked building fortresses. And so uh, this is one that he built. Uh, it was also his burial site. And the uh, Jewish rebels occupied the fort during the revolt against the Romans. And that's, they're probably the ones who, again, broke up his uh, sarcophagus. This is a model so we could see what the, would be, have been on top of that volcano structure. This would have come right up out of, out of the ground. So it would have been quite impressive at that time. Again, uh, in our trip, we also went down inside, underground, into their water storage system down there, which was quite fun, uh, exploring the uh, tunnels down there. Uh, here's Jeb. He's lecturing in the theater. Jericho. How old is Jericho? It's the oldest city in the world. That's, uh, UNESCO even claims that. All right. So long time ago is when it was first started. Again, remember, they had 23 layers of occupation. And there's not only Old Testament Jericho, the tell, the mound there, but then there's New Testament Jericho, and then there's the modern city that's growing up around all of that. So just outside of this area is... Uh, old um, or modern Jericho. By the way, that's also Elisha's spring right there. So if you read the uh, story about Elisha and he heals a spring, so you can uh, drink the water and not die. Right? Anybody remember that story? Yeah. Uh, actually, the first time I was there, I actually took a drink out of there. I'm not sure I'd do that anymore. But <laughs> hey, the Bible said you're not going to die. It didn't say anything. <laughs> I took God at his word. Now, he didn't say about getting terribly sick, but... Uh, uh, this is a round tower at the base of a round tower base at Jericho. Here's some broken and eroding mud brick walls that archaeologists have uncovered. Here's some our, our students standing in front of the mound. The mountain you can see right back in there. Lachish, we found a tortoise there. What do you know? There's another ramp. Apparently, this was a common means of getting through city defenses, is to go over them, and so they built this. And one of the things that uh, I remember reading about is once they got in, uh, archaeologists, when they excavated the houses, they would find arrowheads in all these houses. That means the, what did the soldiers do? They came in and they slaughtered everybody who lived there. And that's what they're, you're seeing the remnants of. Uh, this was interesting. This is uh, when I went to Oxford a couple of summers ago. Uh, we went to the British Museum, and this is a relief from Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh. And he was proud of that assault. And here he's uh, depicting where they built the ramp and the soldiers are marching up it to take the city. And there's, there's a lot more. This, that relief is probably twice as long as this wall, this front wall. Also, very interesting. Let's see, what do you call a piece of pottery with writing on it? An ostrica. Not an ostrich, an ostrica. And this is one where they have this... Uh, set of uh, pottery called the Lachish Letters. And these were correspondence between a neighboring uh, city's commander and the commander at Lachish. And right there, the circled words are the name Yahweh in Paleo-Hebrew. 
Right, so you, uh, you get an example of an ostrica. Bekuvrin. This is probably some of the students, one of their favorite sites. This is, a, <laughs> this is an amphitheater. Okay, what goes on in amphitheaters? Fights. Fights, gladiators. So what do you think the students thought they should be doing? <laughs> is this a church or a mosque? Yes. The Crusaders built it, and then when the Muslims took, took over, they turned it into a mosque. So you can see that they have a little niche pointed toward Mecca for people to pray. This is a loophole. A loophole is where an archer would stand, and it's wider at the back and narrow at the front, so it's very hard to send arrows through from the other side, right? But you can switch angles. So it's part of the fortifications. You'll see that in a lot of their old fortifications. Capernaum. Here's the synagogue. This, uh, remember, Jesus preached in a synagogue at Capernaum? Now, this is not the synagogue he preached in. This was built a couple hundred years later. But notice this right here. The two different color stones, there's black basalt and a white marble up here. The black basalt foundation was probably from the time of Jesus. Okay? Uh, they can look at coins, by the way. Sometimes coins would be put in the floor. And you can date the coins and find out, again, a little bit about it's when it was done. Uh, this is a capital of a column, you know, the top part of a column, and it has an arc on there on wheels. That was at Capernaum. There's another rosette, just sort of interesting to look at. Uh, this is a hourglass shape grain mill, and you hear about two women sitting at a mill. One will be taken, the other one will be left. And what would happen is it's hourglass shaped, and you put the grain in here, and it's hollow, and it would be sitting on this cone and they would actually put um, handles in here on both sides and the women would sit down and they'd pass the handles back and forth and grind the grain. Notice it's made out of the black basalt, which is a really hard stone. Hey, what do you do when you get bored of archaeology? You go noodling and you catch a catfish. <laughs> Hazor. By the way, there are lots of lizards there. All right. Uh, first of all, uh, Hazor. Anybody know where Hazor appears in the Bible? What, what important stories? It's the leader of the northern coalition against the Israelites when they're invading the land. And so we start to see these basalt rocks. Basalt rocks are made out of volcanic material. They're really heavy, really, really heavy, and really, really strong. And they're fractured from intense heat. Who do you think burned them? His name was Joshua. All right, so we see Joshua destroying this palace here and the rest of the city that's inside the wall. Here's the inside of the palace. And you can see, again, fractured stones. By the way, you also see black marks like this very commonly around uh, rebuilt sites. And that black mark tells you where the archaeologists have rebuilt some of the walls to give you a better idea of what it would have looked like but they want to show you what was original and then what they've added. And so they've added the mud bricks on top to show you again. Uh, what a, give you a little bit better idea of uh, what the uh, original uh, palace would have looked like. Uh, here's a model just to show you sort of the layout of the city. And of course, uh, every city has a water system. Again, if you're going to build big walls to keep the enemy out, what do you may need to make sure that you have inside with you? Water. Water is very important in that, that part of the world. So you'll see lots of water systems uh, and tunnels. There's an olive press. This is an important seaport. This is where you see Paul taking off on his missionary journeys from. Caesarea where, is where he spent two years in prison with Felix and Festus, where he's heard by Herod Agrippa II. Here's an aqueduct. Again, water's important, isn't it? And they needed water in the city, so that's a Roman aqueduct. We got to walk along the top of it. That was a lot of fun. Uh, we have uh, crusader walls. So this is a site where you have multiple occupations over a long period of time. Here's an arched entryway from the crusader period. Here's a hippodrome. You don't race hippos there. You race horses. It's where you have chariot races. All right, so that's a very long field there. And over to the right here is the Mediterranean Sea. 
So you got the breezes off to the sea as you were watching the, the races as well. Keep, keep cool. Here's a theater. It's just at the other end of the uh, Hippodrome from where we were. By the way, notice this column. It's been repurposed. It's now a trough. Again, somebody else had to do all the work of cutting it out of the ground, right? And dragging it there, so why not reuse it? Here's a marketplace. Here's a detail from a sarcophagus they had sitting out for exhibit. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just got to keep those uh, uh, really students uh, at bay there. So that's Dr. Whitlock's method. <laughs> All right. What a trip. Uh, again, thanks for being here tonight. So we're going to talk about Wadi Murabat K4. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a report on what we did there. Uh, so before sharing uh, about our current excavation work at Wadi Murabat K4, it's helpful to understand the broader context of the Dead Sea Scrolls discoveries in the caves at Qumran and the early discoveries and excavations of the caves at Wadi Murabat as well. Uh, as the story often goes, in the winter of late 1946, early 1947, some Bedouin were shepherding their flocks of sheep and goats when one of them tossed a rock into a cave opening and heard the sound of pottery uh, shattering. Um, inside the cave, one of the Bedouin uh, found some cylindrical earthenware jars and ancient scrolls. This discovery would turn out to be one of the greatest archaeological finds in history, leading to the search for more scrolls. Uh, between 1947 and 1956, some 900 manuscripts, uh, represented by thousands of fragments, um, were found in 11 caves. Uh, and they're dated between 250 BC and AD 68. Uh, right there in those caves along the northwestern shore of the Dead Sea. Among these manuscripts were Jewish sectarian or religious writings, pseudepigraphal and apocryphal texts, and biblical books, which many of us are interested in, of course. Uh, these largely fragmentary manuscripts, collectively known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, have transformed our understanding of Second Temple Judaism and have also shed ancient light on both the text and interpretation of the Hebrew Bible. Perhaps one of the most well-known um, is Cave One, uh, the initial discovery is there. The rock was thrown into uh, that little bitty hole right there they crawled into. Uh, perhaps uh, one of the most well-known scrolls is 1Q Isaiah A, uh, also known as the Great Isaiah Scroll. This is the only complete copy of a biblical book found among the Qumran caves. And it's the oldest extant copy of the book of Isaiah that we have today, dating to around 125 B.C. Uh, so, for example, in the New Testament, uh, when the Gospel of Luke records that Jesus entered the synagogue there in Nazareth, uh, and read from the scroll of Isaiah, it's likely that he read from a scroll much like this one right here. Uh, another manuscript, um, this is 4Q Genesis B. You see here in an infrared image, uh, lots of technology they use on reading the scrolls. Uh, it's a very sig uh, significant copy of Genesis, uh, dating to the second half of the first century AD. Uh, it is rare that we have such a relatively intact text of the creation account preserved from this period of antiquity. Uh, of antiquity. Can you guys recognize my Hebrew scholars? Uh, what text this is here? Recon What's that? No, 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 it's Dead Sea Scrolls here. Uh, so this is uh, the opening words of scripture here. All right, Butter Sheep, Bara Elohim, Etashamayim, Beta Arts. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, so we've got the first 28 verses right there in this column here in 4Q Genesis B. Uh, this text is virtually identical to the later medieval Masoretic text dating from around the 9th and 10th centuries A.D., um, which our Bibles today are based upon. So in other words, when we read our, uh, the text of the creation account today, which is based on the Masoretic text, we are reading the same text that people were reading 2,000 years ago uh, during the late Second Temple period. That's good news, by the way. Right? So much more could be said about the scrolls from Qumran, but there's more to this story. Uh, these remarkable Dead Sea discoveries extend beyond uh, the caves of Qumran up there on the northwestern shore of the Dead Sea, as ancient manuscripts and other artifacts were also discovered at several other sites there in the Judean wilderness uh, during the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, so among these sites, also located near the western shore of the Dead Sea, are Masada, Nahal Hever, and Wadi Marabat. Uh, notably, roughly 160 written documents were found in the caves from Wadi Murabat, uh, second in total number of manuscripts only to the discoveries at Qumran, where we had roughly 900 manuscripts there. Uh, so uh, the caves in Wadi Murabat, uh, they lie in a deep ravine, Let's kind of point this up here, a ravine here, 
uh, or canyon descending from Herodium, uh, which is just east of Bethlehem. Uh, Dr. Pelletier showed you some pictures of Herodium. Uh, so it begins up there, goes through the Judean wilderness all the way down to the Dead Sea. Uh, the remote location of these caves in Wadi Marabat, which is about 11 miles south of Qumran or 18 kilometers south of Qumran, uh, made for an ideal place of refuge during different periods of history. Uh, when people were uh, being attacked or so on, they would flee uh, to the mountains, flee to the wilderness. Uh, so in the latter part of 1951, Bedouin discovered and looted four caves in the northern slope of the Wadi. The context and motivation for their discovery of the Wadi Murabat Caves was aptly described by Yigal Yadin. He says this, quote, The discovery of the famous Dead Sea Scrolls in the caves of Qumran on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea in the late 40s had a tremendous impact also on their first discoverers, the Bedouins of the Tamir tribe. The importance of the scrolls, at least their financial importance, was not lost on them, and many of them had turned from a tribe of shepherds to a tribe of amateur archaeologists, or rather, antiquities hunters. Towards the end of 1951, these Bedouins stumbled on a discovery which, had it been made earlier, or had it been the only find in the Dead Sea area, might have excited the scholarly world at that time, almost as much as the, as the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls did four years earlier. So following the Bedouins' discovery in 1951, the scholars, the archaeologists come along and they then professionally and systematically excavate these caves in 1952, uh, led by um, Gerald Lancaster Harding, Roland DeVoe, and Dominique Barthelemy, who were busy doing much excavation work at Qumran. So they finally made their way over there. A few years later, in 1955, the Bedouins were at it again, and they found and looted another cave, a fifth cave, on the southern slope uh, there in Wadi Murabat. So caves one through three, uh, you see here, I've got those listed there, caves one, two, and three. Uh, we are in a canyon here, by the way. Those are not small caves, you know, just walking down uh, the street kind of thing here. We're in a very remote area. These are larger caves with rather large entrances. Uh, the placard that was greeting us at the entry to one of these caves, you can see it here, uh, states, quote, the Arabic name Wadi Marabat squares was given to this part of Wadi Darga because of the rectangular mouths of these caves. In the early 1950s, letters written and signed by Bar Kokhba himself, uh, he was the leader of the uh, second Jewish revolt there, uh, they were found in the caves. Up until then, many had believed him to be just a legend. Uh, end quote. And if you notice at the bottom there, they give us a warning. Uh, the warning says, no entry to the western caves due to danger of cave-in. So what do we do? Yeah. So duly noting the warning, uh, we took a look at it and said, ah, you see all those big, uh, that's from the ceiling, by the way. Uh, those things are like, I don't know how many feet long. That'll crush you. Let's just put that. So we said, yeah, we're good. Let's go for it. Uh, so we uh, went in and began to explore the caves there at Wadi Marabat. Uh, so, I mean, what are the odds, right? So we go in. Uh, so. What was unearthed in these caves during the 1950s is nothing short of spectacular. Uh, numerous artifacts uncovered from different periods such as the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, in particular the 7th century BC, uh, the late uh, Second Temple period, uh, the 2nd and 1st centuries BC, uh, the first Jewish revolt, uh, AD 66 to 73, Dr. Pelter mentioned as well, and the Bar Kokhba revolt from AD 132 to 135. Uh, so artifacts from the late Second Temple period to the Bar Kokhba revolt include weapons. So, for example, a blade of a Roman javelin, many wooden and stone uh, spindle whorls, uh, textile fragments, wool, linen, cotton, those type of things, numerous coins from the Roman period, pottery, baskets, and so much more. Uh, so uh, those are the types of things we find from uh, those caves. Uh, now the written documents are uh, perhaps most notable. Uh, so these caves yielded numerous documents from as early as the Iron Age. So we have documents from as early as the 7th century B.C. when Solomon's temple stood there in Jerusalem. Uh, and so from the 7th century uh, and all the way up to the Bar Kokhba uh, revolt. Uh, so we have a palimpsest there uh, from the 7th century B.C. A palimpsest is a document that was written on twice. So they would write on uh, the papyrus, then the scribe would go through and erase it and use it for another purpose, write on it once again. Um, so... Uh, first on this one is a list of names that were common in Judah there in the late uh, First Temple period. Uh, the scribe goes in and erases it, and then there's a two-line letter uh, that goes on it after that. Uh, we have documents from the late Second Temple period. 
uh, which include on this ostraca, on um, this ostracon, excuse me, um, uh, recording decisions of a court. Uh, we also have a papyrus document from the mid first century AD uh, recording debt acknowledgement, right? Yeah, debt's been around, nothing new under the sun, right? You guys, by the way, are accruing debt right now as you go through uh, college, by the way. So uh, you'll get this in a few years from now. Um, so uh, there are six documents also dating sp uh, specifically to the first Jewish revolt, um, which was squashed by the Romans. Uh, so most of the documents uh, found in the caves were brought to Wadi Marabat at the end of the Bar Kokhba uh, revolt. So that's A.D. 132 to 135, so the first half of the second century A.D., uh, among these documents, uh, but by the way, most of these were written prior to that time, the latter part of the first century A.D., beginning of the second century A.D. Um, so among these documents are leather scrolls of religious text. More specifically, a number of biblical scrolls were found here at Wadi Marabat. Uh, so the example you have there is our fragments from a scroll labeled Mur, M-U-R for Marabat, one. Uh, this preserves portions of Genesis, Exodus, and Numbers, these fragments, and it may have initially contained the entire Torah on a single scroll. Uh, so a pretty fantastic text. Uh, another scroll, um, this is Mer 88. Um, this had portions, large fragmentary portions, as you can see, uh, from Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Haggai. You might know this as the Minor Prophets or the Book of the Twelve. Uh, and so this is a pretty fantastic text here as well, much of this preserved. And so using uh, infrared imaging there, you can see it much better there, reading the text. We'll zoom in right on that part there, and we'll look at that. You guys can read that. Uh, so this is from the book of Jonah, right? Uh, so I highlighted that there for you. Uh, then the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, right? Uh, then Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And by the way, one of the uh, cool things about these texts as well, uh, everything from, the end of, from after the destruction of the temple there in Jerusalem, uh, all the manuscripts that we find in all the caves are all proto-MT. What that means is it's the same text tradition the Masoretes preserved, the same text tradition which our Bibles today are based upon. So in other words, when you're reading the, pro uh, the prophets today, you're reading the same text that people were reading uh, back then. Right? Uh, so again, good news. All right? Um, Let's see what else we have here. Uh, also, other religious texts, such as phylacteries, uh, containing texts from Exodus and Deuteronomy, uh, a mezuzah was also found there as well. Uh, there were also papyri, financial uh, documents and letters as well. Uh, among the documents written uh, before the Bar Kokhba Rebellion are four marriage contracts. All right, so that's what a marriage contract looks like. I don't know if somebody got mad and ripped it up or if that's from the ravages of time. Uh, that might be debatable. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I'm just saying. Um, so among the documents written during the rebellion, uh, we have deeds of a lease that's written in Hebrew, uh, which mentions the legendary leader of the revolt, none other than Simon Bar Kokhba himself. Uh, so we now have direct mention of this leader of that revolt. Uh, we also have two letters um, from Bar Kokhba himself, and so you can actually see his name, right? Simeon Bain Kosiba. Uh, and so uh, he went by the name, uh, they called him uh, Simeon Bar Kokhba. Um, and so we actually have his name there, letters from him. Uh, now the discovery of these diverse texts, numerous texts, again 160 documents from Wadi Marabat has contributed significantly to the larger context of the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? It's not just there at Qumran, uh, but much broader. And it also expands our understanding of the tumultuous history of the Jewish people during the late Second Temple period and into the uh, Bar Kokhba revolt. This was a very tumultuous time as they were under the rule of the Roman Empire. Uh, so, indeed, right, what we want to know is, are there more scrolls out there? Are there more caves um, still uh, hiding, concealing uh, scrolls? Indeed, uh, the quest for scrolls continues to this day. In fact, the Israel Antiquities Authority, or the IAA, for example, is conducting a Judean desert survey, a very uh, uh, thorough survey of the Judean wilderness. Uh, in fact, by the way, uh, asking them, there are uh, over 200 caves just around the Qumran area that have not been excavated. Uh, if that gives you any idea of how remote uh, and how challenging this is. The Bedouin are going around trying to find what they can to beat the archaeologists to the punch. Uh, and they usually uh, do beat them to the punch because they know the uh, wilderness better than they do. Uh, so anyways, they're trying to be intentional about that. Uh, the best defense is a good offense. 
And so that's what they're doing with the Judean Desert Survey. They believe that during the excavation of the Wadi Marabat Caves that I mentioned back in the 1950s, K4 apparently did not receive as much attention as the other larger caves, in particular caves one through three. Uh, consequently, the Israel Antiquities Authority recently decided to renew excavation work at K4. So as you can imagine, our team jumped at the opportunity to participate in this IAA project led by Chaim uh, Kohen uh, of the Israel Antiquities Authority. So uh, I want to just kind of give you a little bit of a, a day in the life there. This is Wadi Merbach K4. By the way, you have to get down on your butt and slide into that cave. And in case you don't notice, that's a hole. So it's a lot of fun, okay? So it's not a very big entrance compared to those other caves we were looking at here. So you can imagine how it got uh, overlooked. Not as much attention was given to this. Not to mention the things they were finding in the other caves there. Uh, so uh, just give you a little bit about what it was like for us digging at Wadi Merbat. There's a Chaim there. Everyone say hey to Chaim. All right, he can't hear you. I don't know why you did that. So we'll send the video to him, make him feel better. So anyway, so each day, uh, so there, there he is, and so that's who we joined with there. Uh, uh, there. Oh, our, our first day there when we got there, before we start into it, um, we did a little uh, uh, trial run through there to get acquainted with the Judean wilderness. Some of our students uh, went into a state of shock uh, when they realized you're going to have to do some hiking. You might as well be at Grand Canyon, what we were doing there. So uh, these are uh, not the safest trails, uh, and if they put a rail out there for you in Israel, you better use it. <laughs> Uh, so they, they don't give them to you very much, and when they do, it, it's dangerous. Uh, so they just bebop on down the, there like an antelope or something, and we're the ones timidly going down. Uh, so there's uh, Dr. Whitlock. Uh, he says, man, I got this. Right? That's what, I got this. Um, so pride comes before fall. <laughs> So, so we're going down the trail, and all of a sudden our group hears what we think is this rock slide coming down behind us, down the canyon walls there, and uh, some of our ladies look behind them, and it's Dr. Whitlock coming towards them fast. Do they try to stop him? No, they get out of his way. Uh, so he eventually comes to a stop, um, and there are the results there. He's uh, tattered britches there and all. Uh, so. Anyways, uh, but it was safe there. It was totally safe. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> anyways, uh, all right. So anyways, uh, so there's caves one and three down below. Just to give you an idea, this is uh, quite a canyon here, uh, rugged terrain. Uh, there's some of our guys there hiking back. You go around to the caves there that you were looking at, just to give you context. And you got to hike back up to get to K4 where we were going. So it's not in the exact same spot, but close by. And so we went up there uh, and then uh, kind of checked out the cave that we would be working in. So I just want to give you a little play-by-play uh, -play what it was like each day uh, digging at Wadi Murabat. Uh, so it was fantastic. So uh, each morning we'd wake up after a good hot breakfast at the Kalia Kibbutz, literally in the shadows of the Qumran Cliffs. Uh, those are the Qumran Cliffs there. So we're up there uh, right by Qumran. And from our kibbutz there, you could look out and see Qumran Cave 11, by the way. Uh, so that's where we hung out. So we'd get out, and then we would, uh, after breakfast, we would uh, have our 11-mile commute south uh, to Wadi Mirabat. And um, so that's where we were staying, right there at the caves. And then we'd drive down to Wadi Mirabat. A very nice, beautiful scenic drive. This is our view every morning, driving along the western shore of the Dead Sea to our left, and the rugged uh, terrain of these cliffs coming in from the Judean wilderness to our right. Um, it was absolutely, I mean, incredible. Uh, so that was our view. Uh, and as we go back up the road, we start hitting the switchbacks, kind of going back into Wadi Murabat. And so you can see the cliffs coming down from the Judean wilderness, wilderness now on the western side, going down into the western shores of the Dead Sea. Oh, look out for camel. Um, you don't see those here, right? Uh, so those are the types of signs that you see in Israel, though. So you see, what do you see here? Tractor signs, right? Uh, so you see camel signs there in Israel. Um, yeah, that's one of, like, one of my favorite pictures. Uh, so we get to the trailhead, um, and it's not made for any old car, as we found out uh, with the car that we had. Um, so we made it to the uh, trailhead nonetheless, 
And um, how are we going to get all that stuff down there? Well, we were the pack mules. So we hauled that stuff down that trail. Remember that one that he went tum <laughs> tumbling down? Uh, so we had to haul that stuff down uh, the first day. So we started making our way. Um, there's Matt Carpenter, our poster boy. Uh, he said, I got this. Actually, he didn't fall. <laughs> so y'all are, are waiting for that, right? Uh, so there we are going down the, the trailhead, starting into this uh, canyon system there. Uh, very beautiful. Um, and so we start going down these steep, sometimes treacherous uh, trails there, all the while just taking in these awe-inspiring views. It was absolutely uh, breathtaking. Not because it was a hard hike. Well, it was a hard hike. Uh, but uh, there's uh, Matt. He's making sure he doesn't fall. Uh, if you don't mind saying. Right? <laughs> so... Uh, but there we are, our first day getting down there, and now we're on the little uh, ledge there. Uh, by the way, that's a nice little uh, drop here. It just goes down, so you don't want to step to your left too far there. So we bring our buckets down and all the uh, various tools that we have. And uh, there's Bree. Don't mess with her. Uh, so that's where we set up there. The entrance to K4 is right behind her, and so we would get set up every morning as we get there um, as the sun's coming up. And this is, uh, this is where we worked for the week. Uh, there in Wadi Marabat. Absolutely uh, beautiful there. And uh, by the way, you learn some things here while you're here. This is our bathroom. Here's the cave. That was the bathroom. There's no bushes to pee in, sorry. Uh, so you learn real quick, don't pee uphill. I could share some stories, but I'm not going to. So. Um, anyway, so Ks 1 through 3, as I mentioned before, those are the ones down there. Uh, and you can see one of our IAA guys there. He's a geologist right there. Uh, and so here's the entrance to K4 right here. All right, so each day we get down there, and he would prep us what we're going to do for the day, uh, let us know what's going on. Um, so our excavation... Uh, had two specific areas in which we targeted. Uh, one group worked in the small entrance area of the cave, so right here in the entrance, uh, where you had to literally get on your butt and slide down into it. It was pretty fun, actually. Uh, and then the other group crawled through the cave opening and descended six to eight feet, maybe ten feet, whatever it was, uh, to the first larger opening in the cave. So they went down that little hole right there, um, and that's where they started working, uh, also in very cramped space. The ceiling was not very tall, was it? Uh, not at all. Uh, so, uh, with great excitement, anticipation, we began to use our small and large pickaxes and all the other tools, the trowels and brushes and whatever else we could use uh, to excavate our areas. And so I'm going to show you some uh, pictures of where we're working. There's me and Dr. Whitlock there. Uh, notice the hole in his pants now. Um, and uh, so, by the way, I've got my one sleeve down. I've got my one sleeve down. <laughs> <laughs> my one sleeve down and I've got my one sleeve rolled up just to annoy Dr. Whitlock. It worked. It worked. <laughs> it worked. Uh, so there we are digging. By the way, notice the low clearance here. That's the ceiling and notice we are down uh, low there. So if you lift it up at all, you had a headache. Uh, so there he is. Um, checking out something. I'm not sure. I think he killed a few snakes or whatever down there. Uh, so there I am. Um, by the way, um, one of our team members uh, found out uh, if you don't wear pants, um, poisonous spiders have better opportunities to bite you. Um, and so one of our people got bit and had a swollen ankle for about a week while we were there. I won't say who that is. Uh, so here we are. Um, <laughs> not funny. <laughs> so uh, so our, our ladies on the trip, uh, they were troopers. And uh, so there they are down there. And this is in the lower section there. And you can kind of see daylight right up in there where you kind of go up out of there. And so they're sitting here and they are unearthing Grace and Brie are unearthing um, a fire pit uh, from, we think, uh, the period of the Bar Kokhba revolt. Uh, this temporary dwelling place is there hiding from the Romans. And they are proud of it. 
right? So, so here's part of it there. You can start to see the ash and those types of things. And it was actually a rather large fire pit that they uncovered there. Um, and so don't mess with them. Uh, there's our poster boy, Matt. Uh, you like that one too? Okay. Uh, so he's working in the uh, entrance of the cave here. Uh, again, down in where we were at, we found a number of things from uh, all types of pottery to uh, bones, some of them uh, likely human bones. We found um, other things as well, glass uh, from antiquity and so on. Uh, up here, they found what they believe to be some type of wall structure that they began to uncover. Notice they're already working down from the initial surface. Uh, found uh, large rope handles for these uh, woven baskets that held uh, valuables as well. Uh, so there are a number of things that we found at uh, these various spots. Um, there's Mason, some of the crew working there. Um, oh, by the way, I just want to make sure we all notice this. Notice, he's working. We got a manager here. <laughs> Look at this guy, he can't even stand up. He's sitting on his butt managing him. All right, so how many, how many Baptists does it take to uh, dig a hole? Three? One to dig and two to tell them what to do. You're doing good! Whew, that's tiring. Can I get some water? Uh, so there's Mason working hard as well. So we wear the mask there. The dust gets everywhere, and it is very tough to breathe, so you better uh, have a mask down there. Uh, so uh, there the entrance is starting to get, but we still can't uh, walk into it, or you will hurt yourself. Uh, so we're getting pretty dirty there. That's our first day. It starts getting a little cramped in there. You've got to stretch your legs out. Uh, and now what we would do is... Uh, we would have a line of people that would also then pass up buckets of uh, the excavated material, and they would be specifically marked with either blue tape or red tape to indicate if it came from the lower level or the entrance of the cave, and then would send it up to the sifters out on the ledge. And uh, they would then begin to pour the dirt, and lots of dirt we moved. And they began to pour it in the sifters and look for artifacts uh, as well. Uh, and they got pretty good at it after a while. Uh, in case you're wondering, there's Matt. And so what does sifting look like? It's a very dirty job, by the way. Uh, and so there's Jeb sifting there. Uh, you pour it in, and then you just kind of systematically, it's kind of meticulous work you go through, uh, looking for bones, looking for pottery. And after a while, you start getting an eye for it. You, they pick it up pretty quick. Um, there he is. What is that? I don't know what that is. Uh, and then there's John. He found something there. Uh, so pottery. So um, everybody found some type of pottery or other types of finds uh, on this dig. So that's kind of the process that we would do in getting the stuff out of the caves. We found something kind of cool. The IAA would come down there and they'd take all the pictures and stuff. And I'd say, mate, give me a good side, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, getting in the picture, that's what Mike would do. So, um, And uh, so at the end of the day, uh, some of our guys would uh, strike a pose. And uh, we'd clean up and then we would hike out of there. So after a long day's work, we'd hike out. I don't know how long, was it about a half mile? It was a breeze, man. <laughs> It was a breeze. So we'd hike out of there. And so in the afternoons during our free time, we'd go on different excursions there in the uh, Judean desert. We'd go to uh, uh, Qumran Cave 11 there. That's where we saw our viper. Um, and we would go to places like uh, Masada, uh, as Dr. Pelletier mentioned there, the palace fortress that uh, Herod built. Um, we went to En Gedi. Uh, this, again, of course, one of the places where David fled uh, when he was uh, running there. Uh, and we also, of course, spent much time at the Dead Sea, the healing waters of the Dead Sea. Uh, yeah. uh, and, of course, many of our people got in and had some fun floating in the Dead Sea. You've got to do that when you're there. Uh, you know, if you look closely, I'm not sure who this guy is here photobombing <laughs> our group here, but check out the pristine form. <laughs> that guy's good. Uh, so, I we got a little work to do in our crew here. <laughs> well, this guy, he's been there a time or two. So uh, we go check out all these places. Now, by the end of the week, uh, down, we're down here in the lower level here. We can actually stand up there. The actual ground level was here. It was right about there. We had to just kneel in there and work around. So we can, that's how much dirt we, uh, uh, we got out. I think Dr. Pelletier dug out most of that in 30 minutes. Uh, and now you can see from the opening of the cave how much they uh, uh, Took out, we have rocks there, what they believe was some type of wall, uh, some type of uh, formation there. Uh, so looking much different there uh, when we got done that week. Now, uh, just want to summarize here some of the discoveries that we had. We didn't find any scrolls. 
Uh, so it's a complete waste of our time. No, it was incredible. Okay, it was incredible. Uh, so we found a number of things from the Roman period, specifically the Bar Kokhba uh, revolt. So by the end of the week, uh, we found many things. So our discoveries included, oh man, let's just put them all up there for you. There we go. Uh, it included uh, numerous pieces of pottery, large pieces of ropes from baskets, as I mentioned, a uh, piece of leather, uh, likely from a sandal, um, and also a nail that goes with that. Uh, we found linen, glass, a fire pit, bones, some of which may be human. Um, and we found lots of organic material. Uh, we found some other things as well. Uh, each of our professors and our students experienced the thrill of finding an ancient artifact, every one of them. In fact, every one of us found multiple things while we were there. And I'll give you a quote from Jerry Hughes, one of our Christian Studies majors. He recalled, quote, the feeling of being part of something that could make actual archaeological contributions to the world made even the smallest finds in the sifting boxes seem extremely significant, end quote. Uh, indeed, he's correct. Many of the smaller finds may seem insignificant at the time, but when combined with the numerous other finds at the site, they contribute significantly to building a big picture understanding of a tumultuous period when a number of Jews fleeing the Roman army sought refuge in this cave and the other caves as well. Uh, so that is a bit of our time there. Uh, here's a picture of our crew um, after a, a day's work there. Uh, and I just want to say also just a quick thank you again to our administration, our dean, and all the support from Truett McConnell. And also just to give a shout out to the Israel Antiquities Authority. Uh, these guys rock and they were just a, a blast, a pleasure to work with. Uh, so, thank you guys. All right guys, uh, my name is Zach. I'm a master's student here at Truett McConnell. Um, I'm actually two years into the master's program right now. Um, going on this trip kind of beforehand as we were planning it, as we were preparing, I didn't really know what to expect as far as our involvement in these digs. I kind of thought that maybe we were going to be the errand boys of these digs, just running uh, wheelbarrows of dirt, you know, doing the, doing the really simple work that none of the real archaeologists wanted to do. None of us had experience. None of us had ever been on one of these digs or participated before. So I just kind of us naturally assumed that we were going to be doing the heavy lifting of, of the digs. Well, first week we get there, uh, we found out very quickly that we were going to be an integral part of these digs. We got to, um, as was shown in those pictures, we got to be involved in every single aspect of it, from actually digging up these artifacts to um, just digging down into layers and exposing more of uh, basically time. And we got to sift through all the materials that we were pulling out of this cave. Um, and the coolest part was that each you know, new thing that we were pulling out was adding to that narrative of what we were looking at, adding to the story, adding to um, our understanding of what was going on in that cave at the time. For instance, when um, Grace and Bree found the fire pit down in the bottom part of the cave, um, we eventually went down in, I think it was the next day, because that was kind of towards the end of the day, we eventually got to go in and expand on that and show just how big that fire pit was. And what we did there is we showed that this fire pit wasn't just used one or two times. It wasn't just uh, you know, a random campfire that somebody started. It was used multiple times, likely for um, cooking food. We found lots of bones and, and different organic material right next to it to show that you know, this was a site that was actually lived in. It just wasn't visited, but it was actually lived in. So each new uh, piece of the puzzle added much to the narrative. And uh, it was just really cool to be a part of that. Um, one of my favorite parts was the sifting. Uh, me and Jeb spent a lot of time sifting out there, and the reason we enjoyed that was because we got to find all the little stuff, all the stuff that just piled up and kind of created this new, new understanding. Um, we found glass ourselves, we found pottery, bones, uh, seeds. The seeds were so important to these people because it showed you know, what the organics were at the time and what people were eating at the time. Something that you would not know, most likely, nobody's writing about those things, nobody's you know, testifying about those things. So that's how you learn about what life was like in that area specifically. Um, some takeaways that I gained from doing this trip and specifically at Wadi Marabat was that, like I said, each new item gave us a narrative. And as we apply that to biblical archeology, span we're talking about understanding the world that our scriptures talk about. You know, we're understanding things that maybe aren't necessarily mentioned in scripture, but are giving us a better understanding of the daily life. No, we don't necessarily need that for, 
you know, understanding our scriptures, but what it does is it solidifies in our mind that this is history. What we're talking about is historical fact, and it really just kind of solidifies in your mind that your faith is grounded in reality. Um, so it's just a really cool experience. Um, I think the other major takeaway is that as we went, we had a great opportunity to share the gospel with these people, um, opportunity that we would not have had otherwise. These people are largely in academic circles and are out on the field every day just uh, doing digs. They're not really looking to have uh, religious discussion. They're not really seeking to have that. But luckily, uh, through our service and through digging with them, we were able to start these discussions with them. And we were able to, you know, hopefully get somebody to be thinking about the gospel and hopefully start the Holy Spirit's work in their heart. So a really cool experience and something that uh, I would not trade for the world. You know, the, the Lord provided everything that we needed for this trip uh, all throughout. We had to change up the plan many times. There was a couple hiccups on the way, but the Lord provided every step. So yeah, it was a great experience. Thank you, Dr. Lyon, for having them read the copies of the Dead Sea Scrolls so that now my students can quit complaining about the reading and the reading quizzes um, that you are required to do. I could have you read other things, obviously. Um, yes, Dr. Lyon was very, very um, uh, conscientious to point out that uh, there is danger on the trip, that you may slide down a hill. Uh, and yes, he is correct. The ladies were trying to get out of the way. So Bree told me a little bit earlier that she looked at Grace and said, he's not going to stop. What do we do? <laughs> and Grace responded, we can't do anything. So... <laughs> Truth. And I knew that I would stop eventually. I just wasn't sure how far down I was going before <laughs> I stopped. Although I will say, out of uh, between Dr. Lyon and myself, yes, I was the one the first day that uh, misstepped and uh, uh, went down uh, a few feet. But uh, only one of us out of Dr. Lyon and myself had to actually uh, get the other one up in the middle of the night and drive to an emergency clinic in Jerusalem on the Sabbath uh, because my, the ankle, his ankle, was the size of a football, having been bit by a spider in the cave the week before. And then uh, he decided to drive me through an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood at night on the Sabbath. <laughs> Which, if you don't know what that means, that means little old ladies come out of their houses and yell and scream at you. And that's no uh, joke. And that's exactly what happened. Huh? Yes, yeah, so they are ready to chunk rocks or something. <laughs> well, on Easter Sunday afternoon, April the 21st, 2019, the Trip McConnell Israel Expedition Team arrived at a live firing site in an active Israeli military training zone. Thankfully, it was Passover, so the military was on holiday. We arrived to begin a week-long archaeological expedition at a site operated by a joint effort between the Israeli Antiquities Authority, that's the, again, the, the uh, archaeology arm of the Israeli government, the uh, Israeli Antiquities Authority, and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. The Hebrew name for the site is Bet Loya, and it's a large archaeological site that has limited access due to the military location, the, the archaeology dig seasons, progress very slow in a very narrow periods of time at that site because it is actually in a uh, live military training zone from the Israeli military. The site is located in the Israeli lowlands southwest of Jerusalem at Horvat Amuda in the Lakish region. Beit Loya is on a hill about 1,300 feet above sea level. Remains of this ancient village complex were first discovered at the beginning of the 20th century but remained mostly unexcavated until the 1980s when Hebrew University archaeologist Yoram Safir began uncovering the remains of a Byzantine church with impressive mosaic tile floors still intact. And uh, we uh, went to the, uh, to the church and were able to uh, witness and look at those uh, tile floors. However, excavations on the site were put on hold for a while until 2005 when one of Sarfir's former doctoral students, Oren Goodfeld, began excavating Beit Loya once again. The site has a long and pluralistic history. Um, I have a, well, wrong button. Which button does this? There we go. 
Um, the, its evident history dates to the 7th century BC when the location was part of the southern kingdom of Judah. It, uh, in the 6th century BC, after the Babylonian captivity began, the pagan Idumeans occupied southern Israel. We'll talk a little bit more about them in a moment, including Beit Loya. They remained until the Jewish Maccabean revolts in the 2nd century BC. From about 112 BC, the site was Jewish. After AD 70 and the destruction of, the, uh, uh, destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, the location was abandoned until the 5th century AD when it was once again occupied by Byzantine Christians. And that's when the, the church there uh, was constructed. They remained until the 9th century AD when the site came under Muslim occupation and was occupied then until it was finally abandoned in uh, the 15th century AD. So just a brief uh, overview history of the site. The site has yielded some significant archaeological finds over the years of excavations. Perhaps the most significant began unintentionally during road construction in the 1960s, when workers unearthed what, discovered, uh, what was discovered to be burial caves dating back to the Judean period. The most important uh, element of that discovery were the seven ancient inscriptions on the walls, one of which now resides in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. And this is a picture of that inscription found at this particular site uh, that uh, is in the Israel Museum. The inscription in this picture reads, Yahweh, the God of the whole earth, the mountains of Judah belong to him, the God of Jerusalem. The significance of this particular uh, inscription is that this is the earliest known extra biblical mention of Jerusalem uh, in existence and one of the earliest mentions of Yahweh uh, that we know. In addition to the burial caves, the site has yielded some other impressive finds. The Byzantine chapel with the intact mosaic floors has certainly been one of the most impressive finds. The complex has also yielded seven columbarian or, devote, or dove coats. Uh, you saw a picture of a columbarium in another location uh, that Dr. Pelletier showed you. Uh, the dovecotes for the keeping of doves, as well as eight olive presses and a mikvah, or re, uh, ritual bath. Attention at the site, however, since 2017, has focused on a particular part of the complex discovered by drone. Archaeology teams, under the direction of Hebrew University's Oren Gutfeld and the Israeli Antiquity Authority's archaeologists Mikhail Harber and Pablo Betzer, have centered on a large part of the complex, holding the remains of a structure that is believed to have a 2,200-year-old pagan origin. After the Babylonian invasion of Judah and the beginning of the Babylonian exile, Israel's cousin to the south, the Idumeans, began um, occupying much of the southern part of the land, including Beit Loya. And I want to talk a little bit about the Idumeans uh, from a biblical perspective, the Idumeans originated as Edomites or the descendants of Esau. Idumeans is a later, a little bit later designation that dates to the early Hellenistic period. Uh, the Edomites uh, are more, uh, uh, are a little bit earlier than that. They are the descendants of Esau. In the Hebrew Bible, Edom is identified with the Sierra, the uh, Sierra region. I think I have a, uh, I do have a map. This is. Um, which one is the pointer? There, there we go. Uh, so this is Mount Sire. Now I'll read a verse here in a moment. Um, this is, I can't hardly see that from here, sorry. Um, Jerusalem is here, uh, there, Jerusalem, and our site would have been in that area there, okay? Um, and so uh, the Bible identifies um, that... Um, uh, that uh, Edom, uh, that's the way the Bible identifies uh, the area, is with the term Edom and uh, links it to Esau. So in Genesis chapter 36, verse 6, then Esau took his wives, then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the persons of the household, his cattle, and all his animals, and all his goods which he had gained in the land of Canaan, and went to a country away from the presence of his brother Jacob. For their possessions were too great for them to dwell together, and the land where they were strangers could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau dwelt in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. 
Um, and so uh, the uh, this map is uh, a Google Earth snapshot, and as I'm or the map there, and I mentioned that uh, Sire, the region we just read about, is marked as the red um, bubble there. Okay. Although uh, Jacob and Esau reconciled themselves, of course, before their deaths, the continuing relationship between their descendants was pretty contentious. Numbers chapter 20 records the Edomites' refusal of the request from Moses for the Israelites to pass through their land on the way to Canaan. Both Saul and David subdued Edom, and military conflicts continued during the divided kingdom um, between Judah and Edom. In 873 BC, Jehoshaphat, who was then king of Judah, conquered Edom, and it remained under Judean control until Edom rebelled against Jehoram in 849 BC and achieved a level of independence. Although Esau's descendants should have known Yahweh and worshipped the god of their grandfather Isaac, they instead pursued pagan deities, the fertility gods of the region. Tragically, their false gods tempted Judah as well uh, at times, as is recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 25. 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 25, verses 12 through 14. But Amaziah would not heed, for it came from God that he might give them into the hand of their enemies, because they sought the gods of Edom. So Joash king of Israel went out, and he and Amaziah king of Judah faced one another at Beth Shemesh, which belongs to Judah, and Judah was defeated by Israel, and every man fled to his tent, a result of pursuing the foreign gods of Edom. The pagan influence um, was very much uh, in the area at periods of time. After the fall of Jerusalem in 587 B.C., the or Edomite people seized the opportunity to possess much of southern Judah. The prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel prophesied against Edom for the action. Ezekiel's prophecy is recorded in Ezekiel 25, verses uh, 12 through 15. And that's uh, where I was messing up. I was looking at the wrong uh, reference here in my own Bible. Uh, at this point of the history is where our archaeology team kind of enters uh, the story. This is Ezekiel's prophecy against Edom. Thus says the Lord God, because of what Edom did against the house of Judah, by taking the vengeance and has greatly offended by avenging itself on them, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will also stretch out my hand against Edom, cut off man and beast from it, and make desolate from Taman. The Dan shall fall by the sword. I will lay my vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel, that they may do to Edom according to my anger and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, says the Lord God. So Ezekiel's prophecy against um, Edom or the group that became, uh, was later referred to as the Idumeans. Again, this is where our team kind of enters into the, into the picture a little bit. The Idumeans occupied the part of Israel during the period where Beit Loya is located. In 2017, the directors of the Beit Loya project were surveying excavated areas of the region by drone or unexcavated areas of the region by drone and noticed an unnatural grouping of formations using drone in archaeology in Israel as a relatively new uh, development. And this was one of the first sites uh, that we worked on. One of the, the site we worked on was one of the first sites actually discovered by drone uh, in Israel. And so they noticed this unnatural group of formations that appeared to be relatively shallow on the top of a hill. Further explorations, uh, explorations in a 2018 dig season began to uncover a fairly massive site. Shallow excavations began to come uncover some interesting remains. One of the most significant areas of the new site were base walls of what appeared to be remains of a structure with unusual architecture for the region. This is a picture of one of the early um, uh, uncoveries or excavations, uncovered areas uh, from, the two, from that 2018, from that initial dig site. Um, the uh, particular picture shows you this unusual header and, structure, uh, header and stretcher construction. Um, these stones here, uh, see how you have uh, three, there are three stones 
and then the, the stone and then three stones and the stone. That is uh, referred to as header and stretchers. And the unusual aspect, the significant aspect about this is it's an, it's an unusual type of architecture uh, for the region. And what this did was signal to the archaeologists that there was uh, some sort of uh, not common or uncommon structure that they had in this structure, um, perhaps even had a sacred uh, purpose. Additional uh, discoveries uncovered religious objects around the structure. This is one of the most significant. It is a, a, uh, an altar piece that Dr. Pelletier earlier showed you the altar with the horns. Um, this one has uh, apparently had the horns uh, either it was natural destruction or it very possibly could have been intentional destruction of this particular altar with, uh, with the uh, relief of the bull on the side, which tells us it was a pagan, uh, uh, a pagan object of, uh, in, used in their worship. And uh, it's not very uh, large. It's certainly not when you think of an altar, you think of large, but this is a, a smaller uh, piece. They uncovered this as, as well as some other uh, religious objects around the site. And so uh, the site directors then have suggested that the remains are from an Idumean pagan temple dating to the 3rd or 2nd century B.C. And so these walls then are, are base walls of a pagan temple uh, that, day, that are about 2,200 years old. This particular layer, this particular table, the reason why these are the base walls, again I mentioned that it is shallow, the reason these are the base walls is because the temple was destroyed uh, and torn down uh, probably during the Maccabean revolts later by the Jews. They tore down this particular Idumean temple completely. This layer, all of these rocks are what they refer to as the destruction layer where all of the, the things were pushed in. So these are the, the base walls that are uh, a couple of millennia old here. Our excavation team continued exposing and tracing the outline of the structure. This is what part of it went, looked at as looked like as we got there. We continued to excavate in this area. Uh, we continued, I'll show you a picture in a moment, we continued to uncover the walls uh, of this particular, uh, this particular um, uh, architecture into the, the, this uh, locating where the square structure was at. Um, we also uh, continued to excavate in this outer area and begin to uncover what is uh, an external wall uh, on the outside of this temple structure here. So this would have been uh, the speculation, this would have been probably the internal temple structure and then an external wall uh, outside of it. And so we continued uh, to un unearth these walls during our week there. That made this particular site a very different type of dig site. Uh, the other, uh, the dig site in the cave we were looking for specific artifacts. Certainly here we continued to dig and look for artifacts. Uh, the sheer amount of pottery, eventually they told us during the week, okay, no more pottery out of this grid. If you get it, just discard it. Because just the, num the, the sheer amount of pottery that was coming out of this particular, these particular areas. Um, and the pottery helps them date the sites. And we found... Uh, a, large, uh, a, a large amount. Every day they would go around and collect the buckets and tag the buckets. One afternoon we all sat uh, in a circle under the tent and uh, washed off the pottery and began to look for uh, particular finds. And I could say handle if I knew I was going to get pizza for a year. <laughs> um, this is... Uh, <clears throat> and so um, as we continue to uncover and dig, we continued to discover that the picture I just showed you of the site uh, initially is back this way. And so uh, all of this that you saw in the picture was under, uh, was under the dirt. It all, when we started, it all looked like this, right? And so um, Zach, yes, told you we got to do the real work of archeology. span What he didn't tell you is that heavy lifting, that is the real work of archeology. span Right. You don't see in this particular picture, this is the last day we were there in the group picture, what you don't see, you see this pile of dirt, those uh, extend all over this place and they get to be pretty high. Right? And so that is the glamour work of archaeology 
as it were. The site directors intend to continue to excavate in hopes of further unlocking the mysteries of this impressive site. Again, this is part of a, a, a very large complex of the uh, Beit Loya regional project. There, um, we are in relatively close proximity. Um, we drove around one day to the different areas of the Byzantine church, the olive presses, the columbariums. But this particular uh, area of this large site of this temple and around this temple is very new. Again, there has only been, uh, there have only been a couple of dig seasons here, and the dig seasons are very limited in their, uh, in the length of time that they can participate because they have to focus on the holidays and times when the military is off in order to, um, uh, and if you, uh, many of the uh, arc of artifacts that were found were spent munitions from the uh, Israeli uh, military. But anyway, um, and so this is a very new site, but the site that we're working on here is very uh, large as far, and so there is much, much more uh, to begin to excavate. There were areas of steps uh, that we uh, begin to excavate. Um, other things were found of the week we were there, a particular ring, uh, ring was found uh, an area they found uh, some better uh, some more significant pottery finds where they uh, were more intact and so there uh, is much much work to be done there and so they continue to excavate in hopes of unlocking even deeper mysteries of this impressive site they invited our team back to return to join them in their continued explorations even before the week was over they were already asking when we were going to come back and so we indeed intend on returning. And you um, could very well have the opportunity of returning with us. All right. Thank you. So um, I'm going to share a little bit about where we were in Beit Loya the second week. Um, some things that I can just touch on that other people have already shared, like Dr. Whitlock falling down the cliff. Yes, I turned around and saw him sliding and I didn't know what to do because the footpath was like this big and so I um, a lot of people say that before they die they see their life flash before their eyes I saw my own life flash before my eyes uh, as I saw Dr. Whitlock um, <laughs> sliding down and um, I didn't think he was gonna stop and it was only our first day we hadn't even gotten started <laughs> and so um, <laughs> so um one of a few of my favorite things of the trip overall is the first week that we were there we were digging in the front of the cave and uh the second or third day that we were digging um the archaeologist said okay we need a volunteer to go with these two guys to the very back of the cave where no one started digging yet and just kind of explore and um, see if there's any possibilities of stuff being there. And so I was like, I'll do it because I was sifting, which is really fun, but also going to the back of the cave where nobody else has been was sounded really fun as well. So um, we I went down in the cave and passed Dr. Line and Dr. Willock and was like, see y'all later. I'm going to the back of the cave where no one's been before. So I was really excited about that and um, we went to the back and we got to this point where there was a big rock wall and I thought that's where we we're gonna stop and then you look at the very bottom of the rock wall and there's a hole about this big and this wide and they're like okay so we're gonna go first to make sure it's safe and then when we tell you to come through just kind of get on your side and just kind of crawl through and we'll be there to help pull you out on the other side and I was like um okay so we did that, but I got to look around and um, just help them look and see maybe some possibilities of digging in the back of the cave. Um, so that was one thing from the first part of our trip that I really enjoyed. Um, and so Dr. Whitlock kind of touched on the day-to-day -day things that we did uh, the second week. And so that involved camping out at the excavation site which sounds like it's really, really fun, which it is, and it had some benefits of fresh cooked meals, you know, um, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, just ready for us to eat. Uh, 
as we finished digging. Um, but the downside of that was we didn't shower for a week. Um, so I, I showered the first part of the week. And the reason none of the rest of us showered the rest of the week was because the place where we had to shower was a bed and breakfast off site. And so the first or second night that we were there, we, um, me, Dr. Whitlock, Dr. Lyon, Dr. Pelletier, and Grace were like, yes, we'll volunteer. We will go take showers um, first, and then we were going to take shifts the rest of the week, everybody taking turns. So we get in the car, and we follow the archaeologist out of the site, um, which is, like they said, a military firing ground type thing. And so it was kind of basically just in the middle of the desert is what it felt like. So it took about 10 minutes to get out of that zone onto the... Yeah. Yeah. So we took about 10 minutes to get back to the main road. And so then about 10 minutes from there to the bed and breakfast. And so we got there and the archaeologist said, you know, it's, it's time for me to go home. Good night. I trust that y'all can make it back safely. Um, you know the way. And so, but we, we chose to be optimistic and confident um, in our <laughs> abilities to uh, navigate ourselves back to the archaeology site. So by the time we finished showering, freshening up, attempting to wash clothes in the sink, that was mainly the guys. I didn't worry about that. Um, we, it was about 11 o'clock, maybe midnight, um, really dark outside. So we got in the car um, and headed back. And we it took a little bit longer than expected, but we made it back to the, like the area the, the archaeo or the dig was at, the maze. The, the maze. We made it back to the beginning of the maze, and that only took about 20 minutes. Um, and then we, we started the trek to try and find the archaeology site. And so we were confident starting out. About an hour and a half in, we, we started to lose our optimism. <laughs> and so um, another hour passed, and we just decided, you know, hey, it's 2, 3 AM. Maybe we should just go back to the bed and breakfast and sleep in the warm beds that they have there. And then we'll just wait for the archaeologist to come pick us back up tomorrow and um, take us back in. So after getting lost with my favorite professors in the wilderness, that was a um, great idea. Uh, and so it was a little bit of a break from sleeping on the ground in tents. Um, so some interesting uh, things, like Dr. Whitlock said, we found um, in one of the squares that I was in the first day, we found a ring um, that somebody would have worn. And so that was really interesting. Um, and then other than that, pottery and all different things. Uh, a lot of the days, me and Zach uh, teamed up, and it felt like yard work because we would find what they called the destruction layer, and it was like, yes, we found something. We're going to find a wall. And then they'd be like, okay, that looks great. Keep digging down. Um, and so it kind of felt redundant. But at the end of the week when we were able to see all of these walls and structures and stuff that we found, it was definitely worth it. Um, one of my other favorite parts of the trip was being able to get to know those that we worked with. Uh, we worked closely the first week with just the archaeologists. Um, it was our group and them uh, just working together in the cave. And then the second week, we had a few other groups join us. Um, and we were camping out with them, so we were basically just uh, living together that week and was able to really uh, get to know them on a deeper level. Um, and the people we were working with were from all different cultural backgrounds and religious backgrounds. Um, for example, one of the uh, two of the people that were there was a uh, dad and his daughter. And the daughter, uh, she's from America, but she was uh, enrolled in a university in Scotland. Uh, and they were in Israel seeking to do different things like we were in archaeology and stuff. There was a group of army rangers. Um, that were veterans uh, from the military, and they were in, uh, involved in an organization that helped them with their PTSD as well as reentry into um, somewhat normal life um, after being um, in war and all those different things. And so 
at night at the end of all of the work and we got cleaned up and we had dinner they would always build a campfire uh, and we would just sit around the campfire for two three hours just getting to talk to all these different people um, and really uh, seeking, I know most of our team, uh, really seeking to have gospel-centered conversations with these people, just seeing where they're at and just um, seeking to plant seeds in their life that we're, I know I'm still praying to be harvested at some point. Um, and so overall, I really learned a lot about archaeology. I had no idea what to expect, like Zach said. Um, I had never really done anything with archaeology, and by not really anything, I mean zero nothing at all. Um, and I set out to find the book of Esther because that was the only Dead Sea Scroll that's never been found. Um, I didn't find it, but um, it's okay. I was, I was really hoping, what it was is not really even that I wanted to find the book of Esther. I wanted to come back and ask for free tuition for finding the book of Esther. Um, but that didn't really work out in my favor, but I still learned a lot um, and got to know some wonderful people. Um, and it was a great trip, and I highly recommend if you have the chance to um, try and go on this trip. So.